Okay, Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, the community gathering um, as we continue to go through uh, this whole message of uh, uh, from the bridegroom and understanding, um, you know, what this actually means for all of us um, just in life's challenges and what we all walk through, as well as uh, the prophetic understanding and the promises of Elohim. Um, so welcome, uh, wherever you may be in the world, and uh, all those who have uh, joined us live here. Um, we are uh, we are blessed to have you. Okay, um, for those on video, um, if you do want to join us live, um, you can go to rivershabbat.com dot com uh, or to allabranch dot com. Um, and uh, you'll be able to subscribe to the newsletters and get you on the community list. Uh, and so if you scroll down uh, uh, on the home page on uh, the River Shabbat website, you can just click in the river and hit subscribe. Uh, and that'll put you on the community news list. Uh, once you've put in your first, last name and an email, hit that subscribe button. And then we'll be able to uh, get you out the newsletters weekly. And that contains the link to the live gathering if you want to come and join us. So we'd love to see you uh, and love to have you and meet you. Okay, we, uh, we're we continuing uh, this series on the, we've sort of uh, have this affectionately titled the uh, message from the bridegroom. And, uh, and so we've been going through this journey, eh, hey, Michael, for a time such as this. Yes, and it's, it's been a wonderful journey. And, you know, for those who, who may not know, this was actually the message we delivered at the appointed time of Tabernacles. Uh, but um, we wanted to share this wider because, again, there's a reason we're calling it Message from the Bridegroom. And the world is uh, seems to be spiraling out of control, eh, Curtis? And what would a groom, an Elohim, want to get across to his people, to his bride, at a time such as this yeah and so we've uh we've kind of given it a uh, foundational uh sort of perspective based on the parable of the weeping bride and what that means in relationship to um the dress rehearsal uh the moedim of the fall uh his fall appointed times um and the foundation that we've done this with is the parable of the weeping bride, because if uh, if we make it to the dress rehearsal of Sukkot, uh, then uh, we've not seen the literal fulfillment of the beginning of the fall appointed times, which is the um, the gathering of the bridegroom and his people uh, and then how that plays out to the return of Messiah. And then what of course will be the great wedding feast. And so we've based it on if, uh, if she's looking out on the uh, looking out yet again in the dress rehearsal and seeing that uh, full moon, then uh, the bride, then the bridegroom is tearing Michael. And as most people will know, one of the commandments regarding the appointed time of Sukkot or Tabernacles is that we're to rejoice. So how is a bride supposed to rejoice when her groom is tarrying? You know, and this whole thing that we've been looking at, re really, what is this commandment to rejoice? What does it mean to have true joy as according to Scripture? And what would be the message that the bridegroom would give? um in such a circumstance and so uh that's what's led us into really doing this series to understand really the weightier matters of all of this um because at some point in the chart you've got up in front of you there um it's just linking into the actual what will be one day the literal fulfillment of the fall appointed times and um and again, so we we every year we do a dress rehearsal based around the fall appointed times and we do in honor and memorial uh, as well of the spring appointed times, which were literally uh, physically fulfilled 
uh, by Messiah almost 2000 years ago. And so he's going to do the same thing with uh, his fall appointed times, because all of these things contained in Leviticus 23 in the Torah lay out uh, his great plan of redemption and the framework for which we are to understand uh, all of this and what it actually means. And, um, and, uh, and to anchor ourselves in how he is determined, which is in the foundation of our faith, which is in the Torah. And uh, once we know that, it all points to Messiah, Michael. And once we know that, we start to see that actually the, the scriptures, not only do they read first person, but they become simple. They're very deep, and there's a richness and a depth, but suddenly things like, statements and revelation start to make sense you start to find appointed times language throughout the scriptures as we covered in you know last week even paul the apostle paul would speak in appointed times language even though it wasn't overtly stating this is the feast of you know yeah and we'll speak a little bit about that today um because it's really interesting once you really start to understand this foundationally uh so many things will make sense even when there's reference to uh an appointed time or a feast and it seems random in scripture uh or how the prophets or the disciples yeshua would speak to these things but it's not random at all <laughs> and uh, we don't have to make it up we don't have to do you know a thousand age word study to you know try and possibly understand you know the this the doctrinal square dance around something and then come up with thirty thousand denomination plus later uh variations of all these things um uh it's actually there's a simplicity and a depth involved with uh our faith uh being founded uh where it was always meant to be um our our Elohim is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's not changed his ways. Uh, he's laid this all out for us. It's beautiful. It's deep. Um, and it provides us uh, understanding even in times uh, where maybe we're not experiencing happiness, Michael. But we can still experience joy if we have the true biblical understanding of what that really is in its various uh, components and how joy, rejoicing, rejoice is actually referenced in English uh, in the scripture. And it's quite surprising um, when we don't have a modern sort of Western uh, definition of joy, just how this um, can come about. So we've been going through the, you know, the weeping bride, we did the joy in him, and we're going to look at this aspect of joy in his works. And, uh, and the reverency around this and the power of Elohim. Uh, and just how important it is to understand that when we're seeing these being referenced as joy, rejoicing joy in the English and in our various uh, English translations, that the actual depth and the meaning and what's actually the words that are actually being used in the Hebrew need us to understand how we're to view these matters as it's written and contained in his word. And so it's important that we just don't keep putting, you know, joy is one of those words. It's like, you know, love, Michael, right? You know, you just see love, love, love. You know, it's like, well, we need to know what it's actually saying because the English just simply doesn't capture the context uh, as it relates to the message that's being given uh, throughout the word, unless we understand how our ancient brothers and sisters understood these things. Uh, is that fair? It is fair. And I mean, today we're going to make reference to a particular event that happened with King David, and we are going to make reference to it. Like, but it, Curtis, this was something that, you know, we spent, we stayed up into the wee hours, you know, kind of really digging down on this. And you're realizing, you know, the English is not capturing things, you know, like th th there's just so much. And we realized, you know, for the sake of, today's teaching we're having to make reference but in reality this could be a series in of itself when you really dig down um but again it was one of them reminders you know we need to really look at what's written as opposed like, and in the hebrew as opposed to necessarily the translation of the hebrew yeah yeah and so we're going through in that way to uh understand this because this whole series um and especially you know uh, why we did it around uh, the context of Sukkot um, is that it's extremely prophetic and uh, people just don't really realize that. 
um, generally speaking with, from the English or whatever they've learned as a part of, you know, however they've understood prophecy as a part of their Christian journey or whatever. Um, and then we don't understand these things. And, uh, and yet the greater depth and hope uh, in, in all of it is exceptional. Um, if we can get uh, the ancient uh, Hebraic biblical understanding um, as to what all of uh, the Torah, the prophets, uh, the disciples, the words of Yeshua were all containing and all actually looked at these things in this way. Um, so, um, yeah, it's it's one of those things where uh, you sort of have to really get past our Western mindsets and to understand these things in a different way. Um so the English definition of joy, we went through this previously in the series, but really we understand joy, generally speaking, um, in the English definitions and rejoice as a feeling based thing. Um, but indeed, we've sort of looked at joy in the Greek uh, in its various aspects. We'll continue to do so in the series when it's used in the scriptures that we reference. But the Greek captures things even deeper and is being used in its different ways. Um, and so it starts to move away from just being a feeling or emotion based uh, way of reviewing uh, or, or sorry, of understanding these things. Uh, and then, of course, the Hebrew. Um, which, uh, again, really kind of uses various different ways um, of uh, how our English is expressing this and gives us deeper insight and meaning and understanding that this indeed is not a feeling based um, a thing that the scripture is trying to convey uh, and to give us understanding and a depth and a richness to um, understanding those scriptures and even in a prophetic sense. Yeah, and one of the things that's really interesting with the Greek and the Hebrew definitions of joy and rejoicing is that it actually brings a body context into the into the meanings, which I which the English does not capture because English not only is it feelings based, but it's self based. Whereas the Greek and especially the Hebrew bring about not only a body context, so you you're thinking a community of people, but the Hebrew especially brings out this reverency that comes with true biblical joy. That there's um it is keep it's it's almost as if yes there's joy, but remember who you are before a holy Elohim. Yeah. And so as a part of the series, um happiness is not the problem or the solution <laughs> uh, happiness is uh, a feeling an emotion and, and the father's created us to have these emotions and he uh um he doesn't um he wants us to experience being happy um the question here is is that in a in our western modern sort of uh, faith journeys we've kind of brought this pursuit of happiness into the equation um, uh, versus the pursuit of him. And in doing so, um, this really can have, um, uh, you know, some um, detrimental effects of how we're understanding scripture and even sometimes our faith in, in and of itself. And in fact, it's why some people can actually lose their faith um, because their understanding has been about happiness and not about understanding joy and and what that means. And so we're looking at, you know, do we get joy from the work of his hands? And so we'll be looking at this a bit more. And because the work of his hands includes all things that we can experience in the time domain. And sometimes the work of his hands uh, is not uh, a happy, clappy moment. Um, it's not a moment of our lives where we're experiencing the emotion of happiness. And yet there still is a joy in the work of his hands. And of course, when we look at this in his great plan of redemption, we know that this whole great plan of redemption is not based on happiness. It's actually based in, in rooted in a true joy in understanding what Hel Elohim is doing uh, truly with the works of his hands, his great plan of redemption and much of that does not include necessarily uh us experiencing in our personal lives um just feelings of happiness and certainly in the great plan of redemption although there's great moments that will encapsulate happiness uh within it um if you actually understand the meaning of the appointed times uh and obviously their ultimate fulfillments um and again the actual fulfillment of the spring 
uh, Moedim almost 2,000 years ago, it wasn't based on happiness, was it, Michael? No, I mean, the creator had to lay his life down. You know, the Peter's faith was rocked as a result of the fulfillment of the appointed times. I can guarantee you he didn't feel happy, you know, and... We covered this, this the famous scripture last week that Yah's ways are not our ways and that his thoughts are not our thoughts. And so as he goes about to accomplish his will, you know, more often than not, we've all had these moments. It's like, Father, what are you doing? This isn't making me feel comfortable. I don't understand. But yet there's a joy to be had through that. Absolutely. Okay, so joy in his works, his plan of redemption, or what we refer to as the gospel, his appointed times, the framework, the path of understanding all of this, the desire uh, to see him be together. And it's interesting, um, three of them are actually commanded pilgrimage feasts, as we uh, sort of refer them to, to. But really, it's a desire as a part of this plan to understand this thing we call the gospel um, that as a part of that is about getting together. And so we did that this year um, as a wider community. We had an international gathering. We, we had about actually six of co-gatherings throughout the community this year in various parts of the world. And of course, this is all a part of the Father getting us together, um, whether it be the weekly uh, Shabbat gatherings online or together or both, or whether it be coming together for the appointed times. He wants us, even though we're in a scattered reality, to find, to make these connections and to uh, have this desire uh, to see and to be together. Um, and one of the reasons for that, of course, is that um, you, we're, we're to share in each other's burdens. We are to walk together and to work through um, the challenges of the time domain of this life. And we don't want to be doing these things alone. And so this is why we do and serve uh, what we do. And all of this is going to play into the restoration uh, of the house of Israel, what he calls his house. Um, so in serving his body uh, for your sake and his. So what we're doing is a part of all of this is um, uh, walking in the joy uh, of his works uh, and in the work of his hands. Uh, and then, of course, celebrating the repentance of his people together. When we're in a place of teshuva, when we choose to go into shuv, we are choosing to turn to him together. And as we do that, we will not make it as Michael was saying about self. It's not all about us and, you know, our feelings and whether I'm happy or not, you know, Michael, you've upset me with your teaching because, you know, it's made me feel unhappy. And therefore, if I'm unhappy, you must be telling me untruths and all this sort of things. And so if we're, you know, emotions are there, they're for us to experience and to live out and to work through and to process, but they're not there to determine truth and untruth. Um, and so many of you in your journey have realized just because you heard something that didn't make you happy, you've learned to realize that you were hearing truth or understanding truth. And it's the same way uh, where you've gone through your life and you've had something that's made you happy and you've realized that it wasn't true. So the happiness doesn't determine this. What determines this is a greater sense of us walking this all through. And it's very important at this time, as we come to the end of the age, that we understand that the fulfillment of the fall, the coming fulfillment of the fall Moedim and the lead up to this is not going to be based emotionally based by the creator. It's not an emotionally based plan of redemption. It is a plan of redemption that is absolutely grounded in truly understanding joy in our Messiah. And there is a big difference in getting this because many of the things going on out there that are failing many people right now in their faith is that their faith journeys have been emotionally based. And so when we make big decisions in our lives emotionally, this can often lead us to places of not so good fruit. And so this is why we are to walk together, to be in discipleship, to uh, share in each other's burdens, to have a counsel and a wisdom of many, um, because our life decisions then play a big part in the fruit that it produces. And so th this is uh, this is huge. And of course, it all points to Yeshua HaMashiach. It all points to him if we are in a place of teshuva. 
uh, as a body. And we'll realize that everything that we are seeing in scripture is indeed pointing to our beautiful King, uh, our Messiah and bridegroom. Okay. I'll get you to read this, Michael. Ezra. So this is in historical context, the return of the exiles, you know, they've been, uh, Judah's been in exile for 70 years and they're finally being allowed to come back to the land. And it says in Ezra 6, 22, and they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. Yah had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them so that he aided them in the work of the house of Elohim, the Elohim of Israel. Now, this is one of these passages, again, like if you read this with an English understanding of joy, you'll turn the Feast of Unleavened Bread into one big party. Now, those of you who have, you know, been doing this, you know, a few years now, you've probably realized that Unleavened Bread is maybe not a time of happiness, so th this is a beautiful passage that really shows that the joy that scripture is speaking of is not rooted in emotion. Emotions may be an outcome of the joy, but ultimately, like, remember that the Feast of Unleavened Bread is, is really a time of repentance and getting rid of some of the things in our life that possibly made us happy at the time. You know, this as we get rid of the leaven and the spiritual adultery in our lives. So... Here they're keeping the feast with simcha, with joy. This is clearly showing you, if you have the biblical understanding, especially of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that this was not a happy, clappy, everyone jump around for, for joy, as we would say in the English. Yeah, it's one of the things that has saddened me uh, over the years and serving for many years is to perhaps see the week of unleavened bread has been turned into another pseudo Sukkot <laughs> and all that sort of thing, because, you know, we see these things in the English and we think, Oh, okay, well, we're here to celebrate and, and uh, to party as such, um, you know, and so that we can all feel good, but it's, it's not that we can't be happy during the feast of unleavened bread. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not like, okay, well, let's make sure we're not happy <laughs> during the feast of unleavened bread. It's, it's more this thing of, of the pursuit is not happiness. And in fact, you know, there's been times and it happens to me every year at Unleavened, um, you know, when you're thinking about, uh, you know, the physical picture is, is not eating things that are leavened. And of course, uh, I eat lots of leavened stuff throughout the year and uh, that doesn't make me happy that week to not be able to eat that stuff. Um, but the, the nature of what I'm working through in the spiritual sense is what is the leaven, the spiritual leaven in my house. And as those things are revealed and as you let go of your golden calves, as you let go of things that you may have once learned or thought you understood or you're working through and the father's bringing you out of mystery Babylon, bringing you out of a lot of this rubbish you may have learned in your spiritual journey, there is an actual joy that one experiences. And I'm sure many people here gathered right now will understand this, that you actually experience the joy having something revealed to you to understand that it was deeper. It had more meaning. It had a richness and a depth. And actually, even though you might not be happy that that's revealed, there's actually a sense of joy um, that's reverent as a result of that. And you're thankful that this is actually happening in your life. And every year at Unleavened, um, I tend to be thankful as I'm exalting the Father for yet again being there and having the mercy uh, to take us through this and the and his patience and in in his demonstration and love um, that he's doing as a creator, which he's not basing on whether I make him happy or not. <laughs> he's doing this on all of this fruit and joy in the work of his hands. That's at a greater, uh, you know, sort of parent level. And of course, those who have been parents um, and things like that, you really get that sense that that what it takes to raise a child is more than just that child making you happy. And if you go on a pursuit of the child being happy, happy and then it gets even worse where the child exists to make you happy there will simply be no parenting the result of that is you will rot the child it will be it will literally rot 
the whole family unit and everything else. And we've seen this in a modern world. We're literally watching the generations um, um, rot in front of our eyes because it's been a pursuit of happiness, not the things that it should be. Well, we don't have an Elohim that's doing that with us spiritually. <laughs> and so he doesn't want us to spiritually rot. And so we need to understand these things and how it actually plays out. We need to grow up and become mature in our faith and not be just trying to pursue um, tantalizing knowledge or happiness or blessings or all of these things which so much of the modern faith movements are based on. And this includes both sides of this. This river. I see much of this in the Messianic Hebrew roots movements as much as I do on the Christian side. They just look very different uh, in how they play out, but it's the same fruit. Um, and uh, it doesn't allow people to mature and to grow. So in Isaiah 25, 6, 7, on this mountain, Elohim of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow and aged wine, well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all the peoples, the veil that is spread over all the nations. Very, very interesting language being used here, Michael, <laughs> as we look at these passages, and especially as it relates to a appointed time setting. Well, again, like if you're new to this journey, you wouldn't probably see that this is speaking of an appointed time. Like you've got a, 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 a I'm going to say, it, I believe this is speaking of a wedding feast. You know, you have the references in Proverbs that wisdom has made a banquet, but you know, I believe this is speaking of the wedding supper of the lamb, you know, well-aged wines, rich food, and this is, you know, in that day, on this mountain, it's that kind of language. So this is actually speaking fulfillment of full Moedim language. And one of the things as we look at the, the great prophet Isaiah here, and we'll wait on this um, just in looking at some of the Tanakh understanding of the prophets uh, as it relates to this, is Isaiah really outlays a lot of things as we go on our journey towards the great messianic prophecies, uh, particularly displayed in, uh, in Isaiah 53. Um, and he's setting a groundwork as it gives us insight as to how he, how the depth he understood all of these things, how it relates to how we're using this word rejoice and joy and how it connects to the Moedim. And then he's going to link this to the very prophecies of Messiah. And so if we don't understand, if we just turn these things into a tick in the box and a Hebrew roots, Messianic, Judeo box ticking exercise, um, I don't, you know, Michael and I don't believe you're going to be anywhere near the depth and the understanding of this great prophet Isaiah and why he was actually used to give some of the most powerful prophecies of Messiah we know of in scripture. Uh, you know, contained in uh, particularly in Isaiah 53. Um so it says here, he'll swallow up death forever, and Yah Elohim will wipe away the tears from all his faces, and the reproach of his people will take away from all of the earth, for Yah has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our Elohim. We have waited for him. The weeping bride, we have waited for this, that he might save us. This is Yah, we have waited for him let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And the word there, the gil, to rejoice, to be glad with trembling. With trembling. And then we got, the, you know, uh, the Samad here, the, the exalt, you know, again, exalting him, doing this. What is going on here, Michael? Like, you know, what are we actually seeing? Because if, if this is an appointed time language, then it's just some random thing that he's talking about. This is the day, the swallowing up of death and all of this. Do we really know that we're reading the actual fulfillment of the fall mode? So again, like this passage here of being glad, you know, this rejoicing with trembling, this reverential joy, it says to be glad in his salvation. The Hebrew will literally say Yeshua, which means in his Yeshua. And the context of that is a feast, uh, you know, a wedding feast, which is full appointed times language. And 
it in verse eight here, it even makes reference to a future event that death will be swallowed up. Now, if again, if you understand the prophecies, especially in the book of Revelation, where you know, Sheol will be thrown into the lake of fire, Elohim will wipe away every tear. Isaiah is essentially encapsulating the beginning and the end of the millennial reign right in these few verses right here. And it's powerful. And it, and so he finishes uh, verse nine in in his salvation or um, in Yehoshua and uh, and uh, Elohim uh, is our salvation. And so this is the thing that's saying exalt. It's literally saying exalting the reason for this whole appointed times. It's your Messiah. And you're seeing, you know, again, we have waited. If you if you dig on the word to wait, it actually has the idea of endurance linked in within it. So this is a people that has endured. This should jog some passages in Revelation. And they've they've endured until the very end. I will go as far as saying, and now they're getting to eat the fruit of that, which is their Messiah. It continues on in um, in Isaiah 29 here, verse 18 and 19. Now, we're going to read a, a good few passages from Isaiah, and I, we want people to realize that Isaiah is laying a foundation here, eventually to Isaiah 53, which we're very well uh, acquainted with. It says, In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy or fresh simcha here in Yah, and the poor among mankind shall exult. They will rejoice with trembling in the set apart one of Israel. Now, again, you have to understand that Isaiah is using very biblically charged language here that um it it later on in isaiah 29 he will say that actually the reason the people are deaf and blind is because they've been honoring yah with their lips but keeping their hearts far from him but he's saying in that day what day is the question we need to ask ourselves that the ears will be open the eyes will be open and they will be able to understand and truly hear the words of a book now and again, I was just gonna, so, sorry, Curtis, you go. <laughs> I, I'm just going to say again, just to emphasize that the exalting that's going on here, the Gil, um, it, again, there's a real reverence attached to the happiness in the sense of the simcha or the joy. There is going to be an experience uh, of the emotion, but it's it's literally coming out of an exalting and uh, and a trembling that is actually occurring as we see that day or the fulfillment uh, of these things. And so Isaiah lived in the framework of the Moedim. He understood their meaning and that it was all a part of the plan of the great plan of salvation and the restoration of his house of Israel. And on the note here, this is, it says the physical seed pool of the thousand year reign Curtis and I believe that this is actually speaking, if you've heard our teachings on, especially the the um, sheep and goats judgment, there's going to be a group of people that say, when did we, when did we feed you? When did we, when did we? And that this is like, they're not knowing who the, the king is, so to speak. They, they couldn't see Messiah in someone else. They didn't have a certain understanding. And, when you understand that there's going to be a, a, a physical seed pool that is allowed to enter into the kingdom that didn't fully know their Messiah or could see him or could hear him. And now they've been allowed to actually come into the kingdom like as mortals. This is why I, we believe their joy will come with a trembling. It will come with a reverency. This is a group of people to, to use modern lingo. They got in by the skin of their teeth. It was purely because of Yah's mercy, actually, that they're even standing there, that they're able to rejoice. 
And if you understand, again, you know, you can go back, look at the Great Judgment series where we talk about that part in detail. But if you can understand what they have just been through, what they have missed uh, in and what they have lived through, when you reach the point of the return of Messiah, you can see how they are going to look upon the one whom they have pierced and mourn as if for an only child. There's going to be a realization. Atheism won't exist and all this kind of stuff. There's no wonderment anymore. <laughs> And all these kinds of things they've un- they've gotten to such a place where that exalting in trembling is occurring and of course we believe uh that what's being recorded there in scripture will actually you know again like we say in the note there will be the seed pool of the thousand year reign and uh, as a part of that um it will sort of uh, be a part of the true great reset his great reset uh coming into this last great and final age uh, as a part of uh, the full um, fulfillment of his great plan of redemption, his 7,000 year plan of redemption in the time domain. Goes on in Isaiah uh, in 35, 8, 10 to say, and a highway shall be there and it shall be called the way of set apart or holiness, the unclean. So the Tame here, it shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. <laughs> so there's there's got to be some different form of governance going on right now than we're currently seeing, Michael, for that to even be true um, in any sense. Uh, and we got here, no lion shall be there in a case that that terms, you know, the, the adversary seeks to or, you know, to, to whom he can devour and and going around the earth. And again, we know that according to uh, scripture, that the adversary during this time is going to be actually locked away, um, nor shall any ravenous beast. And, you know, we got to think just animal there, but bestial man. Michael, um, we believe is actually what it's referring to there, if we understand the Hebraic reference. Or think savage wolves, you know, that will spare not the flock, like that they're ravenous. Yeah. So that so these two things, the lions, the ravenous beasts, are not walking on the way of set apartness. And so this is, again, we are experiencing this now, but there's something coming where these kinds of things uh, are not going to be a part of the actual faith journey and and a fulfillment of something. Um, the ransomed of Yah shall return and come to Zion. So the ransomed, this is, you can't have a ransoming of Yah unless you have the blood of Yehoshua HaMashiach. So you've seen a statement here, right, built into this, the return and come to Zion with singing, everlasting simcha shall be upon your heads. They shall obtain gladness, the sasun, um, and joy, sorrow, and sighing shall flee away. So there's going to be the result of something has dramatically changed, Michael, and Isaiah seems to understand this, that actually... Uh, we've got we've got a different order of things going on. Yeah, and I believe there's actually a reference to the parable of the ten virgins in verse eight, where it says, "You know, this way of set apartness it shall belong to those who walk on the way, even if they are fools." Now, th- this statement, if you don't understand the parable of the ten virgins, almost seems like an oxymoron, but when you understand. There's five wise virgins and there's five foolish virgins. Here's what people miss. The foolish virgins are virgins, which means that they've actually dealt with a lot of their spiritual leaven. They also know who the Messiah is. They, so, like, this is this is a believing position here. Like, And people will say, oh, you know, the foolish – Christianity will teach usually the foolish virgins end up in hell or something. It's like, no – they're not allowed to come to a particular feast, but they're still walking the way of set apartness. They have to be if A, they've been resurrected, and B, they're a virgin spiritually. But there's something that they're missing, and that would be wisdom. I believe you're seeing a separation here, actually, of um, the bride and those of the house of Israel that will not be the bride. And in detail, you'll see this laid out uh, to the letters to the seven Kahal in Revelation. And you'll see that there is a reward being given to those who overcome. 
You're not a part of the Kahal unless you are there as a part of the virgin, you know, parable that that Michael's referring to, that to understand that there really is an overcoming aspect to all of this. So without garment preparation, heart circumcision, all of these things, you can have all the knowledge in the world. You can have you can sit there, and know that Messiah is, you know, that he's coming. You can have these things. You can have accepted the blood of Messiah and be part. But you you don't truly have the understanding that allowed the overcoming and that will ultimately be a part of uh, the whole journey. And so this uh, singing with everlasting Simcha and their joy on their heads may be referring to those who did get it <laughs> at, at this point. So um, we need to just be very careful that um, that we don't diminish how great the plan of redemption is because we've fallen into our little uh, spiritual uh, boxes of how we've been taught something in the in the past. We are truly looking at a new order of things and those who have uh, overcome on a journey and those who didn't. Um, and so this is why we want to engage uh, so that we can actually experience uh, rejoicing in uh, his ways and his plan. But joy in his comfort here in Isaiah 51, 3. Now we're leading up to the great messianic prophecies. For Yah comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places. Indeed. Uh, and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of Yah. Joy and gladness will be found her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. So again, we believe we're seeing a picture here of something where uh, there is an overcoming. There is a bridal aspect here. There is truly something that is going to come forth um, uh, by uh, those who actually got this as a part of the great plan of redemption. And so Isaiah is leading up uh, to these great messianic prophecies. And his focus here, again, seems to be on something that's being done as a part of his whole plan of redemption uh, that we believe uh, that Isaiah was laying the groundwork, looked through this through the appointed times framework through the lens of Torah, understand that this is going to be how you're going to get this and all of it's going to point to Messiah. And indeed, when Messiah fulfilled, physically fulfilled the spring Moedim, he held them to account, the religious leaders. You should know what day this is. You actually should have known. You have lived the Torah, you, the, the prophets. Remember, there is no New Testament. He's holding them to account, the word that was profitable and, and for instruction and, and all of the things that it should have been. They had turned it all into a religious journey versus truly understanding what this is. And so Isaiah, uh, all of these things, Messiah is holding them to account. We have had the Torah. We have had the prophets. You guys are without excuse. You should know who I am. But they didn't. And you know, this passage as well, like it re it reinforces that things are not going to be great for Yah's people in the lead up to the fall appointed times being literally fulfilled. And again, you we're giving the parable of the weeping bride. You know, why is she weeping? Well, I would argue what one of the reasons is just the horror that she's witnessing while waiting for her groom to return. But it says that joy gladness will be found in Zion, the voice of song. You know, when you look at this statement, the voice of song is very closely related to the voice of the bride and the voice of the bridegroom. You know, we get these warnings of come out of her, my people, out of mystery Babylon. Why? Because the voice of the bride and the bridegroom and the voice of song will no longer be heard in her. And so here we, we're seeing we're seeing the culmination of Elohim executing his plan of redemption, bringing it all together. And his bride is truly rejoicing because her endurance has now paid off her waiting, her patience on her King. These waste places that she's been a part of that causes her to weep because the bridegroom is tarrying doesn't mean that she's not experiencing a joy. Mm. Um, as biblically it would be understood. So her joy hasn't been taken away because she's weeping. Her joy is remembering the message from the bridegroom and understanding 
how this is going to play out. And there's a time coming where if your faith has been based on happiness and the pursuit of it, it is going to be very difficult to be experiencing the joy uh, with the things that are unfolding. And scripture is a warning of this, that we must be anchored where the bridegroom has given us. And so what's his message to us so that we may experience what he is wanting and desiring us to experience, regardless that the circumstances are not happy for us. And therefore we're weeping because, uh, we're yet again seen, uh, celebrating, um, the wedding feast only from a dress rehearsal sense. And, uh, and so, um, Again, we want to have the perspective that the bridegroom wants us to and to understand so we can experience uh, the joy that can still be found, even though we might be in a place of uh, not being happy. And Isaiah 51, 11 goes on. And the ransom to be, I'll say, return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Now it will go into an everlasting place. Uh, they shall obtain gladness. The simcha here and the joy um, and sorrow and sign shall flee away. So the promises here are going to be, this is Haval. The current state of you not experiencing happiness is going to be Haval. It's temporary, but we, you are going, the bridegroom is saying, you're going to be experiencing an everlasting sense of true joy. And it's not just emotionally based. And so he's reaching out to us at this time, saying, remember how I've spoken to you. Remember the plan of redemption. Understand these things as these come, as these things come to pass, because um, they must come to pass and they will come to pass the way that he has planned it to all for the purpose of repentance and teshuva. You know, in Hebrew thinking, repetition is a key thing to, to highlight emphasis and Isaiah is using this language of joy and rejoicing and simcha and why repeat over and over this is going to happen this is going to happen have joy in this like again this is why we say this topic of joy from a biblical sense is far more important and in fact it's <laughs> I will go as far as saying is that this could be one of the very things that will prevent his chosen bride from even being deceived because she knows where the true source of joy comes from. Yeah. She understands the plan of redemption. She understands how we are supposed to view it. She understands its fulfillment, how it will go down. The ability, in fact, what scripture points to is that the deception that will come upon the believers is so great. It could deceive even his chosen, if that were possible. So we have to understand why it's not possible because she's not living an emotionally based faith based on, you know, some doctrinal square dancing um, based on, you know, whatever denomination she's been, she's actually anchored where she needs to be. And so this is where, and so we're, we're crying out to the body right now, come out of her. Just like scripture is saying, you, you need to understand this now. All of this stuff you think you've learned concerning Bible prophecy, get away from the silliness. You know, sure, it might even sound intellectual, academic. Quite frankly, once you get all of this stuff, it just sounds silly. And it doesn't matter how many big words you use and how many charts you have. It, it, it just, it sounds silly and uh and and naive now that's not a criticism on that's where people are it's more just a result of you know a 15 year old sometimes thinks their five-year-old sibling sounds silly and it's and the reason why is not because they don't love them not because they don't it's because they've matured that much more and so and uh, so the five-year-old might think it knows how to run the house but the 15 year old will have a much better understanding at that point <laughs> and then hopefully by the time the 15 year old becomes adult they'll be able to run the house and so this is this whole progress everything in the creation picture is teaching us and in isaiah 55 8 10 interestingly enough it's it's bringing in this whole uh returning to a pre-diluvian state um uh it's using the creation uh almost like an allusion to the hydro 
hydrological cycle um, that's now going to be experiencing um, being restored back to a certain state. And this, and again, we see in scripture how this will increase the longevity of lifespans in the last thousand year reign. So a lot of things are about to change on earth uh, coming at, uh, coming into this final last round of the end of the age. And, and, and there seems to be quite uh, a statement here that we're going to get back to some pre-diluvian uh, ways regarding the actual creation aspect of it. It says, for as the rain and the snow came down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth. So what it's saying is something's going to change here. So we're experiencing the snow, the rain, and things, but something's not going to change. Um, and we're going to get back to a pre-diluvian saying, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed and the sower and the bread and the eater. This whole allusion to this massive green uh, sort of house effect and, you know, the mist of the water. So it's a very interesting thing that the way Isaiah is relating it is that we're going to be returning back to a number of things. The whole lasting great final age is going to be run vastly different than what any of us have experienced, certainly in our t- time in the time domain and our brothers and sisters that came before us. Um, and so it's interesting how he gives an allusion to the creation as to the degree of just how big the change is going to be, Michael. Well, but for people who maybe have kind of gone, well, Curtis, what have you just said? If, if you look at the current hydrological cycle, the rain cycle, it forms a nice big circle, right? Like the rains come down, it evaporates, it goes back up. Here it's saying that the rain and the snow is going to come down from heaven, but not return. Now, what does it say in regard to the Garden of Eden? It says that a fine mist went out from the ground and that's how things were watered and this is why we think isaiah is giving reference again to um uh going back to pre-diluvian uh conditions it like isaiah would write elsewhere that the animal uh the the lion will eat straw like an ox i mean what's going on you know and elsewhere he'll say that if someone dies at a hundred they're considered a child and we believe this is another reference here to this pre-diluvian state. And this falls into his thoughts are not our thoughts. This isn't just a glib statement to make a point. They're actually not. Our religious interpretations and journeys and all this kind of things, they're not our thoughts. He's saying, I need you to think about it like this. They are found in Leviticus 23. You need to anchor yourself properly here because your thoughts are not my thoughts. They're your plans are not my plans. Your ways, okay, are not higher than my ways. And and so it's making this statement, the heavens are higher than the earth. Understand that your religious dogma does not supersede my actual plan of redemption and how I'm going to do it and how this plays out. And you can throw this away. You can add to it. You can twist it any way you want, but understand he's making it very clear. You're far from understanding Elohim. And so this is why we want to get back to this. And and indeed, Isaiah, we believe, was very aware of this. Um, And so he had delivered the great messianic prophecies and make no mistake of why he's now going in to the last great day and the final fulfillment of the great plan of redemption. There's no mistake into how he's actually laying this out and why he is. Um, But again, we just kind of sort of nitpick Isaiah, and then turn his words into a whole bunch of things to meet our latest religious dogma. So shall the word be that goes out from my mouth and it shall return uh, to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in shalom. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and the trees in the field shall clap their hands. And again, this creation illusion of just how big um, the the simcha will be as a part of this whole shalom that will be truly being experienced at another level um, as we return to the state that he had just laid out. And so really what you're seeing in these two, like this passage, Yah says, guys, remember, my ways are not your ways. This is how I want to do things. Then he speaks about there's going to be an age to come. And he says, my word will be accomplished. It will happen, not according to your religious doctrine, 
you know, and we covered this really in the opening parts of, you know, the dangers of religious traditions and doctrines and things like that. But what's amazing and what I love about this is how it says the mountains and the hills shall before you, they'll break forth into singing. I believe this is actually a reference to the resurrection when the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. You know, Isaiah elsewhere in, in the late 20s, he uses this language of how the, the literally the dead will be resurrected. And it's linked to this idea of the earth bring, uh, either shouting for joy or singing. And so you are saying, guys, think, try to see things my way. There's going to be a fulfillment of the full Moedim. And the outcome of that is that there will be joy and peace, true joy, true shalom. And what we've been saying is that joy and shalom cannot be manufactured, truly cannot be manufactured. These things are an outcome of heart circumcision, repentance into what he is doing and what he's doing through his people. And we can seek temporary states of happiness just based on our fleshy decisions, but it's only temporary and most often can lead to uh, destructive things in our lives. Now, again, you may not have read Isaiah and understanding that he's speaking appointed time language. And as Michael referred to, you're literally reading, we believe, the fulfillment of Yom Tuah. And again, if you don't, and see it and this is why we say through the framework you won't even know what we're reading and again it's referring to the creation so this is not happening floating around in the clouds and everything else this is literally he's giving earth-based uh um uh, analogies in relationship to getting the point across it's here on earth and the creation and again as a part of this shalom is that we will learn war no more um, is one of the great promises during this age. And of course, wouldn't that be nice right now as we see nothing but war unfolding in front of our eyes and all the hurt and horrific things and the destruction going on at the hands of silly people doing silly things uh, and with their silly plans, thinking that their ways are above his. And so it's uh, it's difficult for us to watch as a bride uh, who's waiting for her bridegroom. And some of the things that we're experiencing in our own life and challenges and what we're seeing unfold on the earth are the sorts of things that bring us to that weeping state. Zechariah 9-11, Michael. What's going on here? <laughs> uh, so it says, rejoice greatly. Again, this is the ghoul here, the rejoice with trembling, the exaltation. Do this greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. This sounds like an appointed time, Curtis. Shouting, loud noises, acclamation. Why? Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. And again, we see this in the fulfillment of the spring Moedim when he actually, well, the famous prophecy of Shiloh, you know, that Judah will hold the scepter until Shiloh comes. Well, my understanding of scripture is that Shiloh came, Curtis, almost 2000 years ago. And well, then if, if he hadn't, then the Torah is actually wrong in better sheet. The, 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 this, we don't get to have it both ways. Either either this prophecy was fulfilled and Messiah came, or if Messiah didn't come, then the Torah is wrong. And Messiah very clearly said, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so in verse 9 of Zechariah, you, you're seeing this, you know, future prophecy to the spring Moedim, but there's also this illusion here, shouting. Is, is there going to be an illusion to a full Moedim? Well, let's keep reading. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. He shall rule. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Well, 
that's the fulfillment of the full Moedim right there. This will, when will Messiah give peace to all nations? When will he sit upon his throne from Jerusalem? When will Judah and Ephraim no longer have enmity between them? As also for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Again, I, I believe this is clear resurrection language. Zechariah is literally prophesying of the spring Moedim and of the fall Moedim. It, it, this is just such an incredible passage. All in the context of rejoicing. Rejoicing the Gil with trembling and exulting. So there is going to be these things will come to pass. He just laid out the first and second coming of Messiah and the fulfillment of the whole framework laid out in Leviticus 23. Again, the language of these great prophets is they are clearly anchored there. They're not wavering and making up stuff, you know, and having some experience where, you know, I go on the mountaintop to, you know, have, you know, lights shine upon me and I've been given something that, you know, it, all of this, that they literally are so grounded and raised in understanding this that they clearly know what the plan of redemption is and how it will play out. And again, it's all anchored in the Torah. And given to us because so this is why and again the rejoice greatly right has this trembling and exulting attached to it it's not just i'm really happy <laughs> you and, know and here's the thing curtis what is she rejoicing in i mean who's doing what here yeah because <laughs> I'm reading this. It's Elohim that is doing everything here. He's taking accountability. He's taking responsibility. He's definitely paid the consequence for enacting his plan of redemption. And this is what we're to rejoice in. Hence, rejoice in the work of his hands. Now, there is an illusion here that the servants are going to be included. And don't think it a surprise that it's a donkey. Um. You know, this is the beast of burden given to the house of Israel. And indeed, in the great plan of redemption, even as Zechariah is referring it to here, mounted on a donkey. And this whole thing of the father intends to include us in this fallen state, this donkey state. Um, but he is definitely bringing that this is all a part of the process. And make no coincidence that our king our, and, and the Messiah... And um, the bridegroom chose to announce himself on this beast of burden. There is no mistake to that. And so when they laid, you know, the, the palm leaves and took off their cloaks before Messiah, when he allowed them to actually acknowledge who he was on the lead up to the great fulfillment of uh, the first stage uh, and the fulfillment of the spring appointed times, um, they were also laying that before the feet of the donkey he was including there's no there's an illusion here i'm including you in something and so that donkey's also walking on those branches and those cloaks and whatnot there's an honoring that he's giving to the servitude here um and it's actually very incredible that that these prophecies that are contained by these prophets, they know how this is going to transpire, how it's going to happen. And again, you know, so when we talk about donkeys and donkey stables and all this kind of donkey talk, it, believe me, this is not an insult scripturally. In fact, you've seen a prophet here, one of the great prophets, knowing and understanding the great prophecies fulfilling and relating to Messiah and how Messiah is including the servitude of the beast of burden as a part of this. And indeed, how it was used as an analogy uh, to deliver, help deliver the house of Israel uh, right throughout uh, scripture and indeed the plan uh, the fulfillment of the great plan of redemption itself. So um, let none of this stuff miss us as to what's really going on here. Um, but almost 2000 years ago in the fulfillment of the spring appointed times, Messiah took the scepter and he, he was resurrected. We have a King on the throne. He has a scepter and he has a servitude shadow picture occurring now uh, with his people. Um, and He's got it. All authority now is in Messiah's hands, not man's. 
not under any label, under any denomination or religious dogma. There is no way around this or else you're denying Messiah, whether you know it or not. Jeremiah 32, 37, 41, behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place. I will make them dwell in safety and they shall be my people and I will be their Elohim. So everybody understands that hasn't happened yet, I hope. <laughs> they, well, sorry, they shall be my people and I'll be their Elohim and bringing them back in safety. That bit hasn't happened. The first bit in the scattering <laughs> indeed has been a part of all of this journey for the house of Israel. I will give them one heart. So, this becoming one, this, uh, um, uh, this sense of a, uh, of a different spiritual level than the flesh level, a different understanding, that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. Very much an allusion, again, to the thousand-year reign of Messiah. I will make them an, an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may, re, that they may turn to me. Shuv. I will rejoice in doing them good and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and with all my nefesh. What beautiful words from the king here, Michael. And what a beautiful promise of Elohim as, as we rejoice in this incredible work. You know, there's, there's so much here, but when you realize that Yah is t turning his face back towards his people, you know, in the Aaronic blessing, it says, may Yah lift his face towards you. May Yah turn his countenance or his face towards you. What people don't realize, the Aaronic blessing is actually in future tense. I believe the ironic blessing is a prophecy. Yah will guard you. He will keep you. He will shine his face towards you. And I believe here is the next stage of the plan of redemption when he will turn back to his people. You're seeing the fulfillment of the ironic blessing. You're seeing this, the, the, you know, the bride turning to her groom and the groom turning towards his bride. And, you know, we also want to point out, Yah says, I will turn to them with all my heart and with all my soul, my nefesh. What's that about, Curtis? How does Elohim have a nefesh? Yeah. Unless, unless he decided to be a capricious God and make us go through all through something that, uh, that he wasn't willing to do himself, then you're seeing a direct statement to our Elohim inserted himself in the time domain and it actually didn't cheat and actually experienced something at the level he didn't ask his creation to. And this is unfortunately what Islam does not understand. It's what um, many of our Jewish brethren do not understand. In fact, sadly, it's what many of our Christian <laughs> don't understand. They don't all understand that nothing is impossible for Elohim. What he did, he did for an incredible reason based on a love that we're yet to fully understand in its fullness. And, and so we are to truly get what this is referring to, that he didn't cheat at the soul or nefesh level either. It's real what he's saying. There is a very real component of, of uh, a bride and a bridegroom and a turning uh, to the people. And there's uh, this exalting, this display of joy as a result of the fulfillment of his great plan of redemption, which Jeremiah, again, is speaking in that language, Michael. And people have to understand that chapter 32, what we're reading, he in the previous chapter, he's just spelled out, you know, the the scattering regathering and then the famous you know jeremiah 31 33 passage that's the context of what we've just read it, it's beautiful and i love that little illusion that elohim will do this with all his heart 
and with all his soul, his nefesh. Like again, this is pointing to who your Messiah really is. Ah. This, this is interesting. We're going to get into David here and just talk about this for a sec. Of just remember, David was not going to be used to actually um, build the temple. And so when you understand things like that, especially from his position and what he'd lived, um, I'm not sure David would have been happy about that, Michael. <laughs> um, right. No. Yet. There's something interesting captured in how David understood things and the joy that he had in something regardless. And if that joy had been based on feelings, he may never have done something that we're going to read to you uh, in this. But in the Psalms here, something is captured in 106, 4 to 5 here. We've got here, remember me uh, when you show favor to your people. So the saying interesting, he knows when you show grace to your people, help me when you save them. Uh, sorry, how, uh, sorry, help me when you save them, that I may look upon the prosperity of your chosen ones. Very interesting language here. That I may rejoice in gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. Is this present tense, Michael? Well, like, David... What are we reading here? There's a lot of things that David speaks about in future tense. I will once again offer in the tabernacle of my Elohim. And he's making these statements that can only point to David understood there would be a resurrection because he wasn't experiencing these things in the here and now of his life. No. And so there's something incredible in the Psalms that's recorded in his great state of repentance of and the prophecy, the the prophetic voice that he uttered forth in these in the Psalms is really incredible. He's understanding again this greater plan of redemption. Now, David bought the fleshing floor and the oxen in an interesting account. Now you have a king. He's from a king position, and you have a king that's not going to be used to actually build the temple, which was the great desire of the house of the nation of Israel. Um, and he was disqualified uh, as as such, as some would put it, uh, not allowed, not a part of um, this process. Um, yet David plays a fundamental part in all of this. Uh, and he's going to have to be beyond just a feeling of happiness uh, we believe um, to uh, have these accounts in First uh, Chronicles and uh, in Second Samuel. So, is there a contradiction in these accounts in First Chronicles and Second Samuel? Many believe that there is. Uh, Michael and I don't. We don't believe that there. And this is one of those ones where they're saying, "Oh, okay, you know, um, there was some sort of contradiction going on in the word here." We'll explain that a bit more in a, in a moment. So, what is really happening with King David? What are we actually seeing recorded in these two accounts? Is this really a heart matter? Is there something that David has understood at a different level and a greater level and therefore performs something ultimately uh, as a part of this whole uh, shadow picture of the great plan of redemption? Did David have a greater understanding of joy than our traditional Western view? Um, and so we're going to look at something here, you know, as we ask all ourselves in this, because Michael and I have come to the place where not only is there not a contradiction, but unless King David was operating in a place not just emotionally based, it's it's kind of impossible to kind of see what plays out in these accounts. Is that fair, Michael? Yeah. And this is just as a heads up for everyone. We wish we could do a really deep dive on this, but we'd be, like I said, the, this actually deserves a, a little mini series in of its own. So we're going to have to really, we've brought out the things that apply to this teaching, but Curtis and I have been doing hours of deep dive on this and there's so much there, you know, messianic prophecy, allusions to the plan of redemption. There's so much that we just... It will have to be a future time, eh, Curtis? <laughs> well, this is the thing. When you're trying to make a point of this series and this message and understanding this and then to give an example at a kingly level uh, for the house of Israel, it's just to even touch on these things um, just becomes uh, exceptional. But we can give it reference and, and, and at least some merit here in understanding that the king of Israel was not operating based on his emotions. 
He was operating uh, on some deep understanding, some things. And in this particular instance, we don't believe um, that he would have been happy not being a part of the actual construction of what's become known or come to know as Solomon's temple, which is really Yah's temple. It's not Solomon. Solomon was only used to build it. <laughs> but the, these are these sorts of things where um, we don't understand the, the, the actually what it meant as a part of this culture, you know, we just think it was something they, they didn't go and build a, a skyscraper or something, you know, for some corporation and whatnot. This is the very meaning of their culture, their people, their walk, their faith. It is at such deeper levels. This isn't building some new mega church on the corner of some street somewhere and calling it the house of the Lord or something like, you know, this isn't, we build a synagogue and stick it here. or They put a mosque here or they do whatever here or whatever it is. This is the very meaning of their existence. And it's operating and happening at a level which we truly don't understand in a modern Western sense. We can get a glimpse and discuss these things, but we really don't know seriously how much this meant to King David and what was going on here. Threshing, the douche, to tread out, to tread on, to trample on, to be trampled down, to be threshed. So this whole thing of threshing that we, that we can see, and now it's captured in the Hebrew. <laughs> and of course, we see it often relate to the threshing floor. And the Goran in the Hebrew here, and this is the barn, the barn floor, corn flour, wheat flour, void place, the place of grain. Now, this threshing floor part of how Elohim does something, this winnowing, this separating the wheat from the chaff and all of this is an understanding in, that David had at very, very serious levels and how it linked into the, you know, the, the great shadow picture of building the temple, all of these sorts of things is faith. And his level of understanding is it was at an incredible level here. I'll get you to read this, Michael, as we just look at second Samuel account. Um, but we're just going to see some things unfold here that really relate to threshing, threshing floor and this deeper meaning we believe that David had to bring to this. So just for context, David just counted the people of Israel. Most people know the story. He counted the people and it became a great sin to him. And so the prophet Gad comes to David and says, so Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Shall three years of famine come to you in your land, or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you, or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. So David is being told, whatever you're going to do now, you, you need to consider this. You need to give this some serious thought and not do this flippantly. And then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of Yah, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. Now, I want people to notice here. David is not deciding which one of the three. He's actually like, and this is something I used to think. I um, Erroneously, I used to think that David chose one of those three things. He didn't. He says, let me fall in Elohim's hands. He's saying, Elohim, you decide what my fate shall be. And this is very interesting. I did it too, Michael, as if it was some sort of great spiritual multi-choice moment for, <laughs> for the king, you know, uh, the same thing. But he says, I am in great distress and what? Okay, so we clearly know he's not experiencing happiness here as a part of this. <laughs> I hope we got that uh, sort of just in the basics of the word here. But there's something interesting he does say here. Let us fall into the hand of Yah, right? So this is the point of he's leaving up to Yah for his mercies are great. But he does make a request. Let me not fall into the hand of man. <laughs> so he doesn't want to flee or be in the fleeing position from man on this. Now, this is interesting because David could have handled that in some way, shape or form in the flesh. The ones, though, that he's saying, okay, let it give it to Yah, but then the, if his request is take man out of the equation, we're now left with three years of famine or three days of pestilence, Michael. So 
Now, my, in a way, not only is he not making it multiple choice, he's eliminating one of the possibilities with his request being made known. So it's really interesting. How many of us would do this in an unhappy state? And 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 I'd say, by the way, either one of those choices isn't that great. And and here's the thing: you have anyway. No, we, stay stay on topic, Michael. Yeah, yeah, stay, yeah. <laughs> let's just stay on course here because there's a lot in all of this. But let's keep reading, Michael. So Yah sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. It says until the Moed. Now, th this is an appointed time on Yah's calendar. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. Now, here's the thing. This is David's sin. And the, the David is now about to be tested on something because the people are getting the brunt of his sin. And we we're going to see where David's heart is really at. Now, we, Curtis and I were thinking, what appointed time? What appointed time? We haven't got time to go into how we got to this conclusion, but we believe you're, you're talking right now – you're looking at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the lead up to it. We believe that David started counting the people right after Shavuot and that that would then take you to Unleavened Bread. But th that's where we're at. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, Yah relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, it is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of Yah was by the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusite. Now, now we'll this, get into this, but Arauna is a very interesting character. <laughs> so we're going to we're going to look at something here because this is the second Samuel account they were doing. But this is important here that the link to this is going to be referencing the site of the temple. Hmm. Okay, so this is big, and it's the threshing floor in particular, right? You know, that the, the reference to this. And so, of course, you know, you, um, again, you know, this allusions to, well, think of your starting point, what Shavuot is really about and the, and, and the wheat harvest and what you're seeing with the threshing floor, the counting of the Omar up to this. There's all sorts of things that go in. Like I say, we can't get all into this. But make no mistake that this incredible moment that's going to involve the construction, ultimately, of the temple by Solomon, David is doing something here, not based on his emotions, that is directly anchored in the appointed times. All of this is directly in that framework. And so it's referencing it, not just glibly. It's saying to the morning of the Moed. So everything that Messiah is doing here and all these sorts of things is directly a part of this framework that we should have learned correctly in Leviticus. Um so it goes on to say here, then David spoke to you and he said to the angel who was striking the people and said, behold, I have sinned. I have missed the mark. I have done wickedly. David is in a place of shuv, of teshuvah. He's experiencing this literally. He says, what have they done? So you're striking down the people. David is now in a really interesting place here. He's going, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. Whoa, 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 whoa. What is going on here, Michael? This is a very interesting request because he's seen which of the ones that you chose. And now you know, we've we've got this. Uh, the 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 people are 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 uh, experiencing the death and the pestilence, and David is truly interceding in a place of teshuva here, and he's referring to bring it upon me. What's going on here, Michael? Well, again, remember, David eliminated one of the choices. I don't want to be in the hands of men, but he leaves it up to Yah to decide which of the other two, either pestilence or famine. Yah chose pestilence on the people. Now, here's the thing. David could have gone, well, that was Yah's choice, and the people got it. Phew, I got away with that one. Oh, praise the Lord. But he didn't. I believe David's heart was actually being tested even to this point. It's like, okay, you're, you're, you're saying you're repenting, David. Let me see it in action. David could have easily gone to the place of, 
well, it, you know, in this place of self, the people, you know, it was Yard's choice. He chose to smite the people, you know, brilliant, I'm okay, but he didn't. He actually goes, no, this is not right. This needs to be happening to me. This is such powerful repentance. And Curtis and I believe, again, another time, this may have had lasting consequences. Yeah, big time. And it's interesting you see him, Gad, and he go up and raise an altar to you on the threshing floor of a Jebusite. I mean, the Jebusites were a Canaanite tribe. And so they were we, supposed to be eradicated. Yeah. So we have got something here where there's an actual land redemption going on in a part of this picture that it is going to exchange hands and go into. So you're going to see this to me to whore thing occurring here as well from uh, unclean to clean. And and there's something going on here. David is understanding something uh, at, at, at incredible levels. Uh, again, we, we can't quite break it all down fully at this time, but there is some things here that are alluded to in the Samuel count, but King, uh, but the King said to Arano, um, no, I will buy it from you for a price. So David's saying, no, I will buy this for a price. Now, he could have perhaps chosen to do this a different way, but he's not. And he goes, I will not suffer burnt offerings to Yah, my Elohim, that cost me nothing. Now, this is interesting. He's And this is being done from the position of king. So David bought the fleshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels. Now, let's not confuse this, the statement here. In the second Samuel, first Chronicles is about to tell you the cost of the fleshing floor. But there's a mention of the oxen here for 50 shekels. So you were not actually seeing some sort of contradiction in the accounts. What's being talked about here is the cost of the oxen. And David built the altar and the Yah and offered the burnt offerings and the peace offerings. So Yah responded to the plea for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. Now, something in David's request that he's, just, he's responding to this, um, uh, you know, request that's if David is to be answered, then David is actually asked for something to come upon himself and his house instead of the people. Now, this is really, really interesting. So Yah is answering this. Not only does David make a request to eliminate the fleeing of man, then when the actual decision is made by Yah as to what the judgment's going to be, then David makes a request, put it on me. Someone taking on a plague upon... It sounds very familiar, Curtis. It sounds very familiar. Now, what's even more interesting, David bought the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Like, when a king made uh, a sin offering, he had to buy oxen. And what's very interesting is that 50 shekels of silver is actually the price of a male bondservant. I believe David is buying the oxen for the price of a bond servant because this is about his personal redemption here. He's the one that's caused sin. And just to put this into context, we read 50 shekels of silver. Like to give you a rough modern monetary value, 43,000 US dollars is what you're looking at, minimum. That's what 50 shekels of silver roughly, this is not just, uh, chump change. David's paying a very high price for this. And again, can't go into this, but I believe David here, he understood that he needed redemption. So he's he's literally paying the price of a male bond servant who he is. Yeah. Potentially to a man that he doesn't need to do this on. So this is definitely about his reverence to Yah and what this is actually all about and where it's all headed. What well, another interesting thing here for the shekels and they're just under a weights and measures thing. It's is interesting. There's kind of an argument and it depends where you go and what time in ancient Hebrew history, but generally you're going to sit anywhere from about 220 to about 260 grains per shekel or wheat grains uh, as a basic weights and measurement equivalent as well, um, which is interesting. That equals about roughly, if you take the mean average there, about 12,000 and grains here uh in the um in the component um so that's fascinating in and of itself a little bit later on or in the chronicles chronicle accounts so what did the names mean so now we look at this name in this second samuel account michael 
we so, have something crazy going on here with a Jebusite. So the, this they, this is the Jebusite, and people will say there's a contradiction. There isn't. In the Hebrew of the Second Samuel account, the same Jebusite is called by three different variations in the Hebrew. Now, you don't see this in the English. Like, you have to actually look at the Hebrew there. And there's – so look at the actual Hebrew. Now, the three names – so Arauna or Arauna, it literally means look, behold. So the verb Arau or Aru means look, behold, but Na is this emphatic particle. So think Hosanna. Like, it's the same kind of thing. Look, behold – um or na it literally means shine forth now this is all over the psalms and aranya literally means the joyful shouting of yah so you literally in the three names seeing look behold shine forth yah will shout by the way this is written in some very prophetic psalms where it says elohim yah shine forth and come and judge the nations this is beautiful so you have a jebusite that's being used as a typology of elohim the like now think of joseph the suffering servant the shadow of messiah dressed as an egyptian like Yar is saying that I'm going to look, come in a way that people may not like. Again, his his thoughts are not our thoughts. Now, this same individual, Arauna, he's called Ornan in the Hebrew, which is actually a variation of Orna, shine forth. And <laughs> there's just so much here, but I'm, we're trying to give you a brief synopsis here. It, it, it just, to sum this all up, what's encapsulated in where David is choosing to honor Yah by actually paying a price for something, taking on not only sickness or disease, think sin, he's going to pay a price for something. And who he's doing this exchange with has the meaning of the name. And this is going to go lead to the temple uh, uh, and the winnowing. Look, behold, make ye to shine forth the joyful shouting of Yah, and the all result of all of that captionated in the Hebrew or non is light was perpetuated. Now, if you think this to be a coincidence, you're entitled to that. But there is an incredible thing we believe being captured here. Not only is there not a contradiction in these accounts, but we're actually seeing that is intentionally that this great shadow picture of why you're even seeing um, only a Yah could use a Jebusite to glorify his name and what's going to be the light being perpetuated as the temple, which would become the shadow picture, the great shadow picture of uh, Messiah and the true location of the temple. Um, and so the origins of this would seem dubious unless you knew the names uh, and how they related. So in First Chronicles 21, 22, 23, it says, And David said to Arnon, Give me the site of the threshing floor that I may build on it an altar to Yah and give it to me at its full price, that the plagues may be averted from the people. So he's going to take on what's happening to the people onto himself because that request was made known in the Second Samuel account. And you can miss this. I will take the plague. And, and I'm going to pay a price for this. And so this is interesting. The great, you know, the seed line of Messiah would be King David. And this is an incredible shadow picture illusions here of Messiah. Then Ornan said to David, take it, take it and let my master, the king, do what seems good to him. See, I give the auction forth the burnt offerings, the threats, the sledges for wood and for wheat and for grain offering. I give it all. Now, there's an interesting moment happening here in this account, Barnett. The king has showed up. We've got angels in the picture. If you read earlier in the, in the account, he's seen all these things. He's having quite a freaky moment. He's going, fine, just take it all. Do whatever you got. I mean, the king's here. Yeah, I got messengers here. I got, you know, like, this is crazy. And, and he's saying, fine, take it all. And he's got his four sons with him as well um, and all this sorts of thing. Anyway, there's quite a moment going down. He's going, just take it all. But David's not dealing with it that way, regardless of Ornan's, re uh, Ornan's reaction here. But King David said to Arnon, no, but I will buy them at the full price. I'm not going to scrimp here. I will not take for Yah what is yours, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. 
So David paid it on 600 shekels of gold by weight and for sight. So now you're seeing how much he actually paid for the actual site or the location as opposed to what he paid for the oxen. Now, what's interesting here, and David built there an altar to Yah and presented burnt offerings and shalom offerings or peace offerings and called on Yah. And Yah answered him with fire from heaven upon the altar of burnt offering. In other words, stamp of approval. This has been accepted by Yah. So this is literally happening. Yes, the way you're doing this, David, has my approval. But do not forget that he took on the, the pestilence, made the request for it, at least, as an absolute, and certainly is not going to not pay the full price for this whole thing that is about bringing forth the light of Yah and, and bringing, back, uh, bringing the, uh, the actual joy or the rejoicing of Yah forth in light perpetuated. Then Yah commanded the angel and he and he put his sword back in his sheath. So they're seeing this because we know in the account that he actually saw the messenger. So the messenger is now being told to put the sword back in his sheath. Well, that should be giving some comfort to David. Uh, we would have thought. What is interesting here is, again, just on this uh, per shekel weights and measure perspective, is it a coincidence that roughly the mean average of this on a pure weight and measure perspective would be 144,000 grains to 600 shekels? And 600 shekels is no small price. In fact, in today's term, Michael, we're, we're talking over, I would think over 7 million, you were saying 7 million Canadian, I think, in our discussion. Yeah, 600 gold shekels. 5.2 million US dollar, roughly. And I'm working on very, on the lowest possible thing here. You know, these are huge sums of money. And, but again, the 600 shekels is roughly 144,000 grains. Well, the 50 shekels of silver that David bought the oxen for was 12,000 grains. Now, who's missing? What tribe is missing from the 144,000? Curtis. Dan. And are, are we seeing David a shadow that even Dan will be redeemed? And I believe it's confirmed in the last eight chapters of Ezekiel and the land portions. Mm. Interestingly enough, given to us or revealed to us in land apportioning around this very place. And, with Messiah present. And what people have to realize when the fire came down from heaven to accept David's offering, at that stage in history, the last time that happened was when the tabernacle was set up in the wilderness and fire came down and took up the offering. And this is why Yah says, you keep this fire lit at all times because its origin is heavenly. That this That was the last time fire came down from heaven. The incident with Elijah is not till much later. In, in Israel's history. So David is witnessing something going, hang on a minute. This is when the, the last time this happened, the tabernacle was set up in the wilderness. What am I witnessing? How did David know that this would become the future site of the temple? And I believe it's through the fire coming down from heaven. Yeah. The approval was given by Yah. And so you're, you're using this Jebusite with this incredible fullness of expression of something that is going to be Yah rejoicing in the work of his hands. You're seeing this whole progression of what it's going to become. You've got King David doing this. He's paying a price. He's taking on uh, something or at least the request for it instead of the people, the house of Israel. And David is doing this as a king. We don't think any of this to be a coincidence. For the tabernacle of Yah, which Moses has made in the wilderness, the altar of the burnt offering were at the time in the high place in Gibeon, or Gibeon. But David could not go before to inquire of Elohim. So he can't go to this place, for he was afraid of the sword of the messenger of Yah. Now, we've just been told that what? Where did the messenger put that sword? Right back in its sheath. So are we actually possibly, because this has now been sanctified or stamped for approval as a, the place of the threshing in the Holy of Holies, are we actually seeing a Tamei Tahor actual thing that is brought into David? Is David possibly now in this unclean state? 
And now there's an inquiry. And so this is interesting how this could be actually being alluded to as to why he's actually afraid. We could actually be seeing it to made to horror as it relates to what has now been identified as a set apart location stamped and sealed by the fire of Yah himself. But what's very interesting is like, so David knows he can't go to the tabernacle. It says right there, that tabernacle that was met, like, there's very strict stipulations as to drawing near to the tabernacle. And it's saying David's afraid to go there. He's afraid, but yet he's able to go to this place. And um, what was I going to say? Well, there's no, there's no reason for him to be afraid of the messenger. Yeah. And so what I was going to say, why would David over and over again say in the Psalms, I will one day give sacrifices in the tabernacle of my king? Why was he longing for this? Again, David knew it wasn't happening in his life now. He, he knows he can't go. For, and we believe because he's taken something upon himself. But he's saying one day, I will enter the courts of my king. Why would and David knew he wasn't going to be the builder of the temple? So what time is he speaking of? Yeah, he's rejoicing. It's recorded in the Psalms. He has a different understanding of joy and rejoicing that is not based on happiness. And it's literally getting down to the level of this whole picture uh, that he was participating in that was not based, in fact, far from it. It's possible that at least at the very minimum, he was willing to take on the pestilence that was killing the people of the house of Israel. This is, if this was emotionally based, but I'm sorry, I got a bridge to sell you this. It is impossible for him to be acting this way. And also he's not going to be worthy of actually doing the temple construction itself. He has to be operating at the level that is far beyond an emotional basis and understanding. And we see this in the Psalms or captured in his repentance uh, as he had laid down this level of teshuva and understanding and where his joy really was in his actions as a king at the point of the threshing floor. And again, how it's related to in um, in there's reference to Shavuot right up to uh, the week of unleaven. The, the the psalm we springboarded this off. David says, "I will rejoice in the inheritance of your people." Like David was making that statement after everything that we've just read. He says, "I will rejoice, and I will rejoice with you, my Elohim." Like, yet he's got all this stuff going on in his life: his repentance, possibly taking on a state of uncleanness, and he says, "But I will rejoice." He, David was so eternally minded; it's not even funny. Yeah. We're, we're seeing why, again, this whole capture of even before he would become a man, live his life and end in repentance and giving us the beautiful Psalms, which we uh, engross ourselves in or, and wash over us and meditate on in these Psalms thousands of years later. We're seeing why this was a man after his own nefesh. After it, this is literally he's identifying something, how how he was able to act in this place, regardless of how much he stuffed a lot of things up along the way. There was a place of ultimate reverence that David would keep reaching at peak moments with Goliath, with here at the temple, the flesh before, you know, and again, to finish up with the Psalms in this place of repentance. There's a reason why Yah said what he said. And David is passing the test at the nefesh level. Now, at the flesh level, we all know that David... <laughs> short um and it's not you know we don't need to go there but at the nefesh level it appears that in the key moments of yah's plan of redemption and prophetic reality all pointing to the messiah david is not failing in fact he is passing not just with flying colors he is a man after yah's own heart incredibly demonstrated here and how it relates to the way he gave it to us in the Psalms. He rejoiced even in this part of his life. Just so I tell you, there will be no more joy in heaven over, uh, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, Shuv, than over 99 righteous persons who need no Teshuva. Or what one woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin and does not light a lamp, 
Ooh, what women are lighting the lamps and 10 silver coins and one coin per bride here, Michael. Anyway, um, <laughs> sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. So is this bridal language? We believe so. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the messengers of Elohim over one sinner who enters or choose a shuv and, uh, and repentance. This parable of the talents, you losing your coin. Is it possible, and what we reflect here, and again, we believe it being captured in the Greek here, uh, with the car, the joy, the gladness received on the occasion, like this whole, yes, there's going to be this joy in heaven, but the Sicharo here, the... Um, uh, the Sikaro here, the to rejoice, to take part in another's joy, rejoice together to congratulate. Now, this is the word being used here in this passage. There is now think about the messengers are longing to look into this whole plan of redemption. Their learning is a part of the whole process. They are a witness to something, which the scripture tells us this. And the joy before the angels of Elohim. Now, what is this joy? Is it their joy? Or the witnesses witnessing the joy of something. See, are the messengers needing to see what is actually going on as the result of the great plan of redemption? Because you, you often read this, oh, well, this is all the angels being happy and singing, Michael. I mean, I've seen all the pictures. I well, mean, it <laughs> says that the joy is before the, it's in the face of the angels. Now, who are they in front of? And so is this Elohim's joy that they're witnessing? Now, what is Elohim's joy coming from? It's, well, the, the coins, the talents. The, like We've spoken of this before. This is people. Like The crown will be the service into his body, but it's clearly linking it, the coin, to the sinner repenting. Angels don't have a problem toasting us. They'll do it just like that. Like in fact, we read of angels killing 180,000 people just like that. But Elohim is rejoicing over these people that, in theory, should be smoked. They're repenting. They've been given that choice. And do the messengers need to witness this, Elohim? Why are you going to such great lengths? Why are you even allowing them the chance to repent? Because it brings him joy. Yeah. And they are witnessing now something that they long to look into and need to understand. I'm sorry. I know some face pep perpetuate that, you know, I have my love angel and it follows me around and looks after me and, you know, and all this kind of thing. I'm not saying angels can't be sent to guard us. Not saying that at all. What we're, what the point that's being made here is that the angels are not in love with you. They are not playing some game. These are heavenly servitude realm. And there, and Yah is allowing them to see the joy that he is experiencing. And we believe it's for them to understand. This whole process is teaching them because they will carry out the orders to execute any of us at any given time. So this whole romantic love affair with angels and everything else going on in many parts or aspects of the faith is actually silliness in, in the context of the word, not only in the Torah and in the Tanakh, but the Brit Hadashah, which is actually the New Testament here is pointing out the joy is for them to see. And there's reasons for that uh, in, in all of this. I am acting with great boldness towards you. I have I have glory in you. I'm filled with comfort in all affliction, not happiness. It doesn't say in all happiness, I am overflowing with joy. It says in affliction, he is overflowing with joy, this Kara. So Paul is making no apologies for the, 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 the discipleship that is occurring here, dealing with the early Kahal, um, seeing them um, uh, wash their garments to mature, to go through all of this. He's making no apologies at this point. In fact, he's saying, I'm going to be boldness on this. This is this is literally I'm filled with comfort in seeing the great glory that the Father and the work that He's doing in them, and He's making no apologies is His servitude to this. However, the real position here is: is it bridal? Because He's overflowing with joy because of something that is happening within His people. 
regardless of the affliction. So this cannot be emotionally based. And again, um, it's not what it's saying. You know, I'm flowing with happiness. For Paul to say he has great glory, we think that, that he was speaking there and now. No, we know he said, I have a crown waiting for me. He also says the, the, the crown of joy of serving. He says, you are my letter written in the spirit, not with, he's saying that the work Paul has done in these people is his bridal crown. And in fact, I mean, this leads really nicely into this because Paul in Thessalonians 2 says, but since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, again, this is not fun. He's not in a state of happiness in person, not in heart. We endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. So again, like emotionally, this is not fun. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our master Yeshua at his coming? Is it not you? So Paul is literally saying that the work he's doing in the in the body at the time is his bridal crown. He's just flat out said it. For you are our glory and our joy. Now, here's what's beautiful here. Like the word for glory in the Greek is doxa. The Hebrew equivalent of that is kavod. Yah says very clearly, I do not share my glory, my kavod with no one. And Paul is saying that you, the body, the service, is my kavod and my joy. This And that is in the context of persecution and Satan hindering Paul. So he's not having an emotionally great day, but he's saying, I have glory and joy. It Like, it, who's Yah? This is one of the conundrums you see in the, or so-called conundrums, in the Tanakh, not just in the Brit, Yah says he won't share his glory. But then throughout the prophecies, you see Yah sharing his glory, sharing his crown, sharing his throne. What's going on? And Paul got to this understanding that serving in the body was part of his bridal crown. And that's what gave him joy, because it was what Elohim is doing his people through Paul. Yeah. And them being able to share together in, in the whole great plan of redemption in his works. Paul had an incredible understanding of this, and it was not emotionally based. I do this despite all of this, and and uh, like many of the disciples, unto death. Um, again, he's basically saying, I don't do this on an emotional level. Romans 15, 30, 32, I appeal to you, brothers, by our master Yeshua Messiah and by the love of the spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to Elohim on my behalf, on my behalf. So Paul's making a request here. And this is interesting. I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. So he's referring to the Sanhedrin system that he was once a part of. So these people are, you know, you, you know, arguably the most knowledgeable people technically in the Torah that may have ever existed. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, I mean, you know, outside of the original encampment, um, but even then there was a progression and an understanding through the prophets and things like this at this point that, that had been revealed in the prophets. So it's pretty hard to argue that the greatest understanding of the true uh, prophetic nature and meaning of Torah could have been at an any higher level from a pure non-Messianic Hebraic sense. And he's saying that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. So what are the unbelievers in? It's not Torah. It's not his word. It's Messiah. And that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. So the believers. So that by Elohim's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. Now, this is interesting. He's being rejected by the religious system. And so he is seeking this place of Chara to be face to face Panim. He's seeking that sharing in one another's burdens, Galatians 6, that this is 
that that it may be Elohim's will because he's experiencing gladness in the sense of being with those who get it, who are acceptable, who are not unbelievers. And of course, we experience this as a part of coming together, any of us. And again, we experience that on incredible levels at, at Sukkot, this, just this past Sukkot. So it's quite incredible um, what he's referring to here. There were, um, just because we experienced such great joy all coming together at Sukkot didn't mean everybody was experiencing happiness. <laughs> You know, it, it, it's like we, as we traditionally think, um, but there was great joy regardless of people's circumstances, challenges, health, whatever it might be. Despite it all, we had incredible joy uh, in coming together there. And in um, um, Philemon? Or Philemon. 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 <laughs> Maybe, maybe we're both wrong. Sorry, Michael and I just can't help it. We have to say this every time we did it, Sukkot as well. And then my dear brother and sister corrected me and said, well, we think you're both wrong. <laughs> and so, in either case, doesn't matter. I thank my Elohim always when I remember you in prayers. Okay. Because I hear of your love and of the faith that you may have towards Master Yeshua for all the saints. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge this intimate knowledge of something, of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Messiah. So this is directly related to something here, all right? So love is, true love uh, is directly related here. I hear of your love, your phileo, uh, of the faith. So this whole purpose of walking together is going to be effective to gaining of knowledge of something. This discipleship, this being in the faith, this sharing in one another's burdens is going to be effective in our, and essentially our understanding and knowledge of something. And that knowledge is Messiah himself. For I've derived much joy and comfort from your love, from your phileo. My brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, Man, this context of brotherly love, Michael. This is why we say we enjoy Messiah in each other. And this is Messiah working in us. Thus, the work of his hands is bringing us joy. So Paul is writing to uh, uh, Philemon here, but he's encapsulating something and he's about to make a statement. Like, But the context of what his request will be is the joy of Messiah working in each of us and this body perspective of joy. And so the work of his hands is directly, uh, he's having joy in the work of Elohim's hands directly as a result. Uh, um, he experiences uh, the joy of the work of his hands actually in fellowship. Okay, so before we leave this slide, is it... Philemon. No, it's Philemon. <laughs> Sorry. Why do we put people through this? It's not right. Uh, all right. Um, okay. No, so it's just quick. Oh, okay. No. Hmm? There. Because Paul makes a very interesting thing here. Accordingly, though, I am bold enough in Messiah to command you to do what is required. Paul is saying, I've got the authority here to command you. Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, now a prisoner also for Messiah Yeshua, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. This is, I believe Paul is demonstrating the character of Messiah here. Yah could demand obedience. He could demand it, but he appeals. And this, again, I believe brings joy. Because they're so ahad, they're so unified, they're, they're so together. Paul is saying, look, I don't want to have to command you. I want you to, I'm just asking, please. Yeah. He doesn't want to pull rank. He wants to do this in the phileo and the brotherly love and sharing one another burden space not the Nicolaitan space of pulling rank, which is what he was raised in. Because that would steal joy. 
Okay, let's finish up here with these. So can we steal his joys? The question we've been asking through all of this and to ask, we ask this question at the each of end of the sessions. Can we steal Elohim's joy through our walks, through our, our journeys? Is there something, what was it he was demonstrating? He wanted the messengers to see all of these sorts of things. Is there something that is giving joy to our Elohim that is on demonstration to the cosmos? And so we, we want to consider that how is he bringing this whole great plan of redemption together and keep our, our sovereignty intact? And is joy of Yah actually attached to one of the greatest demonstrations that there is? And if that's the case, who can take that joy from him? And if that's us, wow, that's something quite serious to consider. Are we affecting even how the messengers can see all of this? Are we affecting how each other see this? Are we affecting how our spouses see it? Like by stealing his joy in our faith journey, are we actually taking away the whole demonstration of what this is really about? Because if we make this about happiness and how we feel from day to day, moment to moment, month to month, year to year, if it was based on happiness, we've not just stolen his joy, we've obliterated it. But is it possible that we can reach a place in our faith where, like King David and like we discussed today, where we actually can go about a very difficult circumstance, be a part of this great plan of redemption, the shadow pictures, and not steal his joy and be a, a, a servant after his own heart? And this is what we believe, the account, what we truly saw David do at the highest levels uh, of the shadow picture of the temple um, and what would be there to help teach uh, um, the whole journey of the great plan of redemption in the house of Israel. Ultimately, it's can, can we find joy in his kingship? Because his thoughts are not our thoughts. He's going to go about things in a way that we don't fully understand and may not even necessarily agree with from our fleshly perspective. But can we actually have joy in submission to him? So the things we've got to consider with this regarding stealing his joy, uh, it, can this be about how we honor him? Our focus was really on this today and with how we honor each other uh, in, as a part of the joy uh, of the work of his hands. Um, and so we want to consider these things as a part of our walk. Um, are we whitewashed tombs? Are, are we trying to be also holy while we, you know, dishonor him, dishonor each other, all these sorts of things? Um, are we denying the power of the Ruach and therefore the chance of overcoming matters? Uh, both spiritually and physically. You know, what is actually happening here as a part of we walk this out? Um, and has the faith become all about us? Is it self-based? When we, I, I see on the Christian side, when they talk about the bride of Messiah, it's all about the bride. Bride, 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 bride. What's in it for her, what she does, what she gets, everything else. And not not that a lot of that isn't true, but but the focus of the bride as it's being delivered in scripture is really about how the groom is seeing her. And what's really interesting is, is that what we don't hear a lot on either side of the river is what is it? Is this about the bridegroom? Do we actually care? I tell you how much Christian materials I have seen and it is bride, 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 me, 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 and everything else. And how little there is about his plan. What's he doing? Why he's done it, how he's done it, everything else. They just simply go to the, you know, the Polaroid, uh, you know, well, he died for me and now it's all about me. And hopefully with this series, people are starting to see that actually the emphasis is the groom. It's his plan. He's the one that like, yes, we're going to have joy, but it's in what he's doing. He is the one that's taking accountability, responsibility, paying the consequences at a level that we will never fully comprehend and spend an eternity figuring out. But are we? I really hope we can see that he really is the source of our joy. If happiness is, doesn't become a pursuit, and if happiness is not a fruit, it's just an outcome or a state of being, then what truly produces that eternally? 
See, we can all try to manufacture happiness temporarily in a Havel sense in this time domain. But if you are going to achieve this eternally and not take away people's emotions, not make them robots, not do all of these things that he's accused of, what Michael and I are trying to say to you is that the level of understanding of joy isn't just important. It is so great to understand that this is not emotionally based, that it is not about a feeling of emotion because it actually could impact whether happiness could even be achieved eternally. And what achieves the outcome of that emotion is something much greater than an emotion. And so this is something that we're learning now while we're in this time domain and how he's not going to cheat this. He is looking for a people after his own nefesh. The outcome of that is going to be an emotional happiness. That's not the discussion. But what if you were Hasatan and can make it all about that? What decisions might we make and could it affect? I think he's legitimizing love and sovereignty and the eternal existence. And he's not cheating. So for a time such as this, Michael? Can we find joy in the work of his hands in spite of our emotions? My joy has been in times when I know Elohim is allowing crushing and trial to come my way. And for us to truly, like, again, like, it, it pleased him to crush the suffering servant. He wasn't happy about it, but the outcome of it would bring joy. Like, we really have to start viewing things from a plan of redemption perspective, but essentially from an eternal family perspective, because if you have that lens, the outcome of that truly being written on your heart, the outcome of it will be peace and joy and love. The three things that you can, the three fruit of the Ruach that you can't manufacture. You cannot fake this. So as we come to the end of the age and for a time such as this, the message from our bridegroom and how much he loves us and what this is all about comes with an understanding that we believe his bride is going to want to hear. She's going to want to know because if she does, it actually comforts her. It actually puts her in a place where she may be able to be a witness and a light, even as we come to the end of the age. Because our faith just isn't emotionally based. And therefore, the things that need to shine forth in its righteousness at the end of the age will not be circumstantially based. And so there is a message as we desire our bridegroom to come that he's given to us. Remember this. Know this. Become this. It's all about this. And so, uh, for many of you, um, as I'd shared in the, in the messages here, I want to finish with this because uh, we lost our, our beautiful uh, MJ, who was a gift to us many years ago. Uh, she was a rescue, uh, neglected, uh, and the father brought her to us. Um, she had many little quirks and issues at the time, and we worked with her, and she uh, simply became one of the most beautiful animals that, uh, that I've ever had and a true member uh, of our family. And uh, just a beautiful gift from the father uh, to us. And uh, she passed away in uh, uh, with me last night, and uh, it was very difficult. But I'll tell you, I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy, but I had joy in the works of his hands, which is his creation. His creation is the work of his hands, and it's why the great prophets reference it. And I took joy in thanking Elohim for the blessing that she has been uh, for Pip and I. Um, I praised him for that, and I meant it. Um, she passed away so peacefully and so beautiful uh, with me. And uh, my little prayer, 
over her, much as the ancient Hebrews did with burying their donkeys with them <laughs> uh, at times. Uh, and we have the geological evidence of that. And I believe what they were actually saying to the father is, uh, you know, this is my statement. Father, may you raise that donkey with me at Yom Teruah. If they knew and understood the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets or Yom Teruah. And so my little prayer uh, over her as she passed away was, um, you know, Father, if you see fit, may you raise her with us. Uh, may you raise our beautiful girl with us uh, on that day. So we'll see what is his will and, and how it all works. But I made my request be known and I did it in a state of joy, but not in a state of happiness. So this is just these places where I think if we get the whole picture of this, um, I have no doubt that eternal happiness would come if the father did raise her with us. And I wanted to make this point. It was the outcome. But it doesn't take away the joy that I have in the work of his hands and, and what he gave us and the blessing that we had as a result. That was not taken. So. Let's finish there and uh, we'll come back. Uh, we'll come back uh, shortly here uh, for a quick Q&A as we continue our prophetic journey of the message of the bridegroom to his bride.